now we are live. Michael Balboni, thank you so much for being on the show today. This is fantastic. Thanks now, for having me. Really, it's good to talk. Yeah, it's great to see you again. It's been uh, it's been an interesting year for those who will be listening to this perhaps in the future. We're recording in August 2020. So still, shall we call it the height of the pandemic? Michael and I haven't seen each other in quite a while. We're all working from our various homes. And uh, listen, why don't we start with this, Michael? Since um, So now you've had an amazing career that's focused around New York and the tri-state area and, of course, on the United States. But we have audience members all the way from uh, Brazil right up to uh, Canada. So I'd like you to give an introduction for the folks that might not be uh, as involved in uh, politics when you were involved in politics. So just kind of give us a, a quick career path uh, for you and then uh, how it culminated into your interests today. Sure. Um, thanks for that. So I am a, a, a local guy. I uh, grew up on Long Island and uh, went to school, both undergraduate and law school uh, here in the tri-state area. Uh, I then immediately got into the political world, became uh, counsel to the New York State Senate Committee on Judiciary, and then I did that for a couple of years, and then I went to local government, Nassau County, which is right outside of New York City. I became a deputy county attorney and, and started doing trials for, uh, actually, uh, I worked with the police department very closely. I took courses at the uh, Nassau County Police Academy. And then um, I then moved on and, and ran for the New York State Assembly and won. I served in that, ha in that chamber for seven years, and then went to the New York State Senate and um, I was in the Senate when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. um, I unfortunately lost friends, knew many families that were impacted, and still to this day run across them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it had a profound effect in my life and my, my trajectory. So it's, uh, it's been part of the mission of everything I wanted to, to try to be involved with and try to make better, to try to prevent an attack from ever happening again. And so I got very involved in, in some of the architecture of how to develop a homeland security as opposed to a national uh, um, defense strategy. And so uh, working on all sorts of levels, I worked with uh, both uh, Secretary Tom Ridge and Secretary Michael Chertoff. They appointed me to the National, uh, to the uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council. I've worked on a bunch of different think tanks in Washington, D.C., all being a part of the New York State Legislature. And one of those roles, I was able to have a, a national security clearance, which I still maintain. <clears throat> and. Um, the clearance uh, allowed me to be considered for a position when a new governor came in to be the Homeland Security Advisor, <clears throat> which I did, which, which was a cabinet position. At that point in time, I had this ability to, to uh, basically work with the men and women of 13 different agencies, $5 billion of the budget uh, represented their expenditure. And then um, basically I was a senior law enforcement official in the state of New York. Which, as you can imagine, in days following 9 11 years, it was an incredibly uh, stressful, high profile position. And learned a ton by the very best. And also kept my contacts within the federal government. Had a chance to work with all the uh, three, letter, three letter agencies and still maintain uh, contacts with friends, uh, uh, former um, within those agencies, but also uh, folks who are currently active as well. And then I got a chance to um, leave government in the private sector, created a company. Uh, called Redland Strategies, uh, and um, still I'm proud to say about eight and a half years uh, working with this, having a lot of fun. And I also do the healthcare side, where I represent an association of 90 nursing homes. So right in the thick of things. Oh, and, and one other thing that I don't think you and I necessarily chatted about, but the governor uh, of the state appointed me as the uh, as a trustee to the New York Power Authority, which is the largest public utility in the United States. And I was named chairman of the Infrastructure and Cybersecurity um, uh, committee for that agency. So I still get a chance to get really into the weeds on energy security, which informs my uh, um, my perspective on both the interface between private and public uh, cybersecurity, but also cybersecurity for the society writ large. Right. And Redland Strategies is a consultation company, correct? So you provide consultation in cybersecurity right. and you've got strengths in Department of Homeland Security as well as healthcare and utilities, right? Critical infrastructure. Great set, great, 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 great set. Okay. Sure, sure. You, there's so much to unpack in what you just said. I want to go to quite a few different areas here. At some point, I want to jump into the utility world. So we've got to talk about IT and OT. Um, but I want to go back to about three minutes ago. And you said something, and I might butcher it a little bit here. You talked about the difference between homeland security and I think and country defense. Yeah, or home defense. Right, right. National. Well, what's the difference yeah. there, Michael? Like, explain that to us. That's interesting. You know, prior to 9 11, 
um, when we looked at uh, external threats, it was obviously the Department of Defense, um, the national security agencies like uh, NSA and um, CIA, but there really wasn't a lot of involvement in the police departments or public safety agencies within the states and cities. Hmm. After 9-11, uh, Homeland Security became hometown security. And it really was something where uh, we, we put officers, we expected expect them to be, on, be front on front lines, lines of terrorist, of terrorist attacks. attacks. Now, now you know, you know, we've, we've seen, seen a lot, lot of attacks, attacks around the world, um, whether, 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 whether it was Mumbai, Mumbai or whether it was Paris, you know, these horrific attacks, attacks that have happened. Uh, we luckily have never experienced that. But we needed to shore up the capabilities of our local police departments to be able to respond and, and hopefully investigate, prevent, but then of course respond and mitigate any type of attack like that. I was uh, I got a chance to have a ringside seat in the development of those capabilities. And you know, as you look back now, and you and we know then what we know now, we probably could have scaled it differently. But back then, we didn't know where the threats were coming from. Al Qaeda, ISIS, you know, they all went through their cycle of. Uh, uh, prominence, um, effectiveness, and then of course decline and, and almost eradication. So, but but nonetheless, we now face new challenges. And uh, what is consistent with the efforts we did early on for homeland security, with what we're doing now for bio health and safety security, is the fact that it still requires a different relationship, conversation, and capability between the national institutions of government and the local institutions of government. So uh, again, I've been very blessed to have served in, in both houses of legislature and the governor's office, have uh, experience with local government, so I have and, and, uh, a lot of experience in the federal uh, um, government that I have the opportunity to kind of see how things translate from top to bottom. We might be able to draw some parallels from that in cybersecurity too, because you know, up until mildly recently, up until the cloud was a thing, you know, we shored up our defenses, right? We we you know we 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 put these right. big castle walls, we dug a moat, we filled it with crocodiles, yeah. right? We put a one draw bridge, only traffic in and out, but then the cloud floated across the top of the castle right. and just started sucking information out of it, you know. And and now we we have we, oftentimes we actually use vocabulary like this: we have centurions or we have nodes, right, within networks now to try and detect things that are happening internally. And of course, IPS was an answer to that over a decade ago, uh, to be sure. But an interesting parallel nonetheless. Well, let's dig into um, utilities then. How So how have the Homeland Security uh, laws and the, the, the shape of America changed since 9-11 in mm -hmm. utilities, especially for New York? What can you talk about there that's publicly available? So, uh, so after 9-11, there was always a concern about uh, taking weaponization of the um the battlefield to the internet you know the physical battlefield to, to, to the virtual battlefield and so we've always wondered how do you shore up the defenses obviously again you know um cyber security and the world wide web is a worldwide issue and so what could new york state do to prevent it or what could the local governments do and what we realize is that there's a lot of things we can do yes we can't be offensive we can't go after the, the guys who want to try to come and steal our uh, information, but certainly we need to shore up. And, and what happens, what's happened prior to COVID is that we had uh, legacy institutions, you know, legacy networks. Uh, we, we put things in place. There isn't a lot of money to kind of, you know, rehab everything the way you should. We saw with the attack of WannaCry, you know, how did that happen? Well, it happened because you didn't uh, patch, you didn't update, you had uh, legacy uh, unsupported uh, software on your networks and therefore they were exploited. And that's where you had the ransomware attacks. Well, we, we continue to see now the evolution of the understanding of the cyber architecture and its vulnerabilities. So what you just said is absolutely essential and that now it's gone from this kind of, the firewalls are very, very important, crucial in many respects. The question also moves out to, well, what about the internet of things? What, what about the ability to create an offensive capability using things around us? And, and, and what about the access? What, who's getting on the network? And how do, we do, uh, how do we verify who they are, who they say they are, and allow them to get into parts of our network that we want them to and nothing more? And then the big thing, you know, after 9-11 was whether or not you could actually take the supervisory control and data access networks, the SCADA systems, and manip manipulate them so that you could take down, say, a centrifuge in uh, a Middle Eastern country, 
to prevent the, uh, um, the development of, of a uh, nuclear device, or something where you now you actually shut out the lights of a Ukrainian city, which, which actually happened. And, uh, and it, it, if you're familiar with that, you should take a look. Uh, I think it was Crash Override was the name of it. And, Is that right? Um, basically, it was right before it attacked the Ukrainians, uh, two Ukrainian um, companies and basically shut down the lights. And what was fascinating, if you look that up, um, you can see how the screens, the monitors, were basically taken over from the controllers and they couldn't do anything to change it, which is an incredibly uh, frightening thing when you're trying to maintain you know, power and heat and light, particularly in wintertime. Um, and so that whole question about, is it merely academic? academic? Is, it, is it urban, urban legend, legend that you can utilize a cybersecurity attack to take over a skated network? That was answered, no, you can't. So that brought up the whole question and the whole focus on the interface between um, IT and operational technologies, you know, so again, like the uh, SCADA. So here in the Power Authority, New York Power Authority, we are the first utility to do a digitization from the beginning to the end of the network. We're in the process of doing that right now. Digitization allows you to take a nanosecond uh, snapshot of the energy util usage of, across the network and be able to adjust. Because what's happening now is that people are producing energy that, that goes within the network as opposed to simply just utilizing it. And so there's all questions about load balancing and um, if there's a surge to how to prevent the surge network. And of course, things that, you know, if there's an outage as a result of a storm, you know, how do you respond to that? So um, that digitization is key to the operation, the efficient operation of a utility, but it must be done in such a way where you close the door on the folks being able to take over that network. So this ITOT conversation is top of mind for yeah. U.S. utilities. I, I once I met the um, CISO for New York Power Authority, Ken Carnes, I think his name is. I'll try and get him on the show. This is very interesting. Yeah. 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 So so now he's going to the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. Oh, is that right? Um, to okay. Work with them. I'll find He's out. He's a who tremendously is. talented, fantastic okay. guy. We're gonna. We're sorry yeah. to him, but, yeah. but I predict great things for him in the future. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Well, I'll chase him up anyway because it'll be a great dialogue. And then the current guy. Now, to move the audience members, because still in cyber, you often think it's just IT, IT, IT. We're talking OT. But let's, let's, and I've, I've thought about this for a long time, actually. Cyber people are going to start swallowing physical security you know, like, a, like it's a guppy fish. And that's already started to happen. So what are we actually worried about with New York Power Authority? I remember in 2013, I think they called themselves you know, the Bowman Avenue Dam hack, and they were actually successful. I think they called themselves the Iranian Cyber Guard, something like that, that claimed uh, this attack. And they managed to pull... No, the sluice gate had been dismantled for repair that day. That's right. They were successful in their attack on the SCADA system for the Bowman Avenue Dam, about 19 miles north of Manhattan, but the sluice gate was under repair. So a little bit of lady luck on our side that day. But I also seem to think that the cyber guys are starting to look at things like nuclear, biological, chemical um, material coming in on ships. So scanners in the New York uh, and New Jersey port uh, harbors. Are you able to talk about that or is that super secret stuff? Well, I, 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 it's, it's all part of the... Um collective strategy and how to protect uh, the infrastructure of, the, of, of, any, of any city worldwide, but especially in New York. We know that New York is still, uh, unfortunately, a target. And it's funny, with the advent of COVID, people really aren't talking about terrorism anymore. Yeah, they yeah. really focused on just you know the, the impact of the pandemic um, and how to keep people safe and not have the, the healthcare network overwhelmed. And, but yet at the same time, get the economy back to work. Which is why there are two things that are being accelerated dramatically. One is automation. You know, we were already seeing you know driverless cars, driverless trains, things like that, becoming more and more um, within the lexicon, and certainly a lot more focus and resources on that. But then also in, in healthcare, you know, the ability to use everything from uh, telehealth, you know, to be able to have a doctor call in on you and and, and read your vital signs. Uh, virtually, and then be able to talk to you and diagnose you and prescribe uh, medicines mm -hmm. to robotics. You know, uh, when robots don't get sick, 
And, and so in, um, if you had a COVID ward at a hospital or a nursing home or assisted living, you know, it might be a good idea to not have somebody uh, in there to, to do custodial or to, to help mm -hmm. transfer patients or it might make sense to utilize a, uh, a robot. Now, this has a lot of concern across the, uh, across the country in terms of uh, uh, just the whole issue of job uh, loss and job replacement. But it also should have a concern among everybody in terms of the attack surface. And um, you know, every time you utilize a machine to do work and in, in particularly sensitive work, you gotta make sure that you have all of the abilities to maintain the safe operation of that equipment. Uh, the other thing that we're also finding is that, you know, there is a huge concern about folks working from home. Again, the attack surface, uh, the ability of folks to tap, tap into your Zoom calls or, or, you know, your private networks and be able to steal your data or basically colonize you. And then anything that you participate in, they can participate in. You know, there's all sorts of, of really uh, um, essential concerns, important concerns. And again, it's, it's almost, it mirrors what happened with WannaCry. So there's so many folks who, uh, at their home network, you know, their routers, they never thought about a router and, and, and how to pr protect their routers. And, there, and the FBI, by the way, has, has given lots of information as to how to do this personally. But it also, you know, do you, using your own personal network, are you thinking what firewall you're using? Are you thinking about, you know, right. strong passwords necessarily? All the different things, the, the different hygiene, a lot of people are, urge folks to consider. It's not being done at the, uh, at the personal level. Right. Well, so you're on the board, the advisory board for these 90 um, nursing homes around the uh, New York area. What has changed since COVID started to today as far as automation, robots? I mean, it sounds still to me a little futuristic, but are things actually happening in the last six months as far as robots doing yeah. things that people once did? Give us some stories there, Michael. So, so I'd be clear, I've said accelerated uh, the adoption, but the adoption has not occurred. Um, okay. Certainly with telehealth, it, had, it has become um, something that a lot more, a lot of insurance companies looking for. So, it, it, for example, you know, if you have a cardiologist and um, it's difficult for the cardiologist to go to a nursing home and make rounds, and yet it could be absolutely essential. As we've seen throughout, you know, the COVID situation, what did the disease attack? The folks who had other diseases, what we call comorbidities. Mm. That was those the vulnerable populations to COVID. Well, their other ailments, like heart disease, still continue and still need to be treated. And so sending a physician before COVID, getting a physician to go in, into a nursing home, particularly a rural nursing home, hard. Just, just, just hard. It's not that he gets a physician to go make rounds because they're so busy. And that's why hospitals are really the focus of uh, most physician services. What does telehealth do? Telehealth allows a uh, cardiologist to come in and check on a patient in a nursing home. And there are other things that you can do as well. So for example, there's uh, you know, they have these uh, digital thermometers that can transmit, transmit the temperature to a physician as they look on a screen. They have the ability to um, um, check uh, uh, oximeters, um, they have the ability to check the um, uh, palm, the respiration, uh, to listen to heart sounds. These are all things that can be, this information can be transmitted digitally. Okay. And so physicians can hear this without having to go into the home. And so it, it increases access. It provides greater safety because you don't have somebody from the outside coming into uh, right. a nursing home so you can or assisted living. So that's yeah. that's beginning to, to really use. All right. What needs to happen, of course, is that government needs to say, yeah, that's where we're going to invest our dollars. We're going to do a better reimbursement rate for physicians who make those uh, telehealth visits as okay. opposed to um, an actual physical. And so that policy has not really followed. That, that uh, needs to be uh, uh, Yeah. So physicians are actually making less when they do a telehealth visit than what they do in actual in-person or in-office visit. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. So, so the acceleration of all things digital has taken place, but telehealth is the one that's really stuck. Obviously, I mean, physicians can't go into these, let's call them danger zones and, and telehealth right now then. So let me understand this. We've got a laptop or some kind of computer. There's probably a nurse or a staff member at a nursing home that has to hook the patient up to certain things, right? And then those things that get, they get mm -hmm. hooked up to 
translates in real time through the screen to the physician who makes the diagnosis and then the nurse, the attendant, whoever it might be that's next to that patient in the nursing home does whatever the physician prescribes. Have I roughly got that right? That's telehealth right, right now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what you're concerned with then, so your consultation coming into these 90 homes is secure all this stuff. Is that right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So no, what I do make sure that it doesn't uh, use that worse. Right. So what are your suggestions? Like, you know, how do you, this is a monumental task, Michael, right? Where, where are you starting with this? And let's, let's talk about how you would structure it. Like let's help our you know, audience members who maybe have 90 different locations for things like remote working, have similar challenges. How are you structuring the, okay, doctors, you're doing life-saving things with these computers. I know you can't stop it because they're all us in cyber. We just want to put a stop order in, right? <laughs> and then everything's safe. Unplug. That's the ultimate. But obviously, since we're not doing that how what, what's your strategy moving forward with these uh, 90 homes michael well first of all there's got to be an awareness a lot of people aren't don't appreciate the vulnerability essentially so that, so we really need an awareness campaign government has got to be a partner in that can't just be the private sector saying look you're vulnerable and because then people expect people to say well then buy this it shouldn't be that way it should and the mm -hmm. buy this can come later but initially it should be you're vulnerable. Government needs to say you're vulnerable. Government then needs to say, since you're providing an essential service that we partner with you on to provide a uh, uh, funding for through the Medicaid and Medicare system, we need to make this a priority. We need to come out with dollars that sit there and say, you know what? Um, you need to make this, <clears throat> you need to do an assessment. <clears throat> you need to see what's in your environment, know what you don't know. <clears throat> and then we're going to provide you with dollars to be able to make this type of investment. And whether it's a match, whether it's some, some, you know, well, you got to put money up yourself, but you have to invest in technology. And so, what's happening right now, today, as a date of this podcast, is the uh, U.S. government is contemplating a real, uh, sizable investment in cybersecurity, recognizing that everybody, the virtual workforce, needs to be supported. They need to do things safely. And so, there's actually a bill moving through Congress, which would. Um, Basically, put I think uh, the, the number is pretty huge, you know, in the billions okay. that okay. would be wow. utilized. By local and so one of the things that I'm urging the, the local government, governments that I work with is to become digitally shovel ready. So what, what, what's that shovel ready reference? Many times there were road projects and funding for, you know, to create a highway or or build stadiums or do things like that. And there isn't a uh, inexhaustible pot of money. So what you have to do is you have to get head of the line. So what people do is we want to fund things with a near-term benefit, which means if they're shovel ready, if you're ready to, to start the project, you've got the plans all done, get that shovel on the ground and start working, then you move up in the process, in the line to receive these dollars. Well, let's use that same analogy for digital projects. So let's make sure that you've assessed what your vulnerabilities are, what are the different changes you need to make. You know, is it what, what's your particular vulnerability? Is it uh, the um, Internet of Things? Have you not closed down a lot of your, you know, the, the um, opportunities for bad guys to utilize your networks against you? Um, is it access control? Hmm. You know, do you need to do that? Do you, do you not scan your environment? Do you not know what kind of vulnerabilities you are, you, you have? You know, uh, these are the types of things that, that people should do and identify how to go forward. And so uh, if and when this money comes through, and I think it's going to come through, then you're ready to raise your hand and say, yep, we got a project that can produce this type of benefit and it can produce in the near term. So we're ready to receive these dollars. Okay. Now I've got a lot of questions here. What does the government get out of this? Why should the government spend a billion dollars? Why not let private sector just sort it out? Because we are only as safe as each of the bricks we put into the wall. Now the thing about cyber is that it's ubiquitous. Um, you, you can't, necessarily see where the vulnerabilities exist. You can't see where the attacks are coming from. The, uh, the attack surface expands and the attacks evolve. Hmm. And so to expect a local government that perhaps runs SCADA in it for a township um, to, to be on top of all this thing is probably unrealistic. And in some ways, it is a national defense. To get back to that concept, right. it is a national defense perspective. Right. You know, the, the, right. the federal government, if you want to help us secure our infrastructure, then, then help us invest. Tell us where we should do the investments. Help us with dollars. But then also then come back and say, did you do it? Did you do it right? You know, it's the follow-on that is most times lacking. 
Right. So considering the consequence to a disruption in critical services, what we're saying is this should be looked at kind of like a branch of military. It's a national defense strategy. And and that this is where the government needs to touch industry. I, I get that now. That's very interesting. Well, good. Go back to WannaCry. What? Go back to WannaCry. Yeah. WannaCry yeah. Was a worldwide. Right. It, it, it affected transportation, healthcare, I mean, yeah. all of the, of the basic services. That, that as citizens we expect to happen and and they came in and, and they disrupted that well it's in the government's best interest particularly as it relates to getting back to work and to work safely right to make sure that this is done in a way that uh, you know they can help right right yeah okay so remote working getting back to work safely um here's my two cents on it i think 2022 I think we're going to go for it. Winter's coming. So typically flus are stronger. So I think we have a second wave. This is what I'm thinking. Then I'm going to ask you what uh, what you think. So I think second wave comes this winter, hits pretty hard globally, as well as, you know, the rest of the United States. Um, I think even if we see a vaccine sometime in Q1 or two fiscally next year, to get a billion people vaccinated is going to take a couple of years. So frontline workers get it first. The rest of us get it afterwards sometime. So I think 2022, by that time, I think we'll be used to doing what we're doing today. I think the world will have changed. Um, so I see this as permanent, uh, but I, I, I'm still not seeing the readiness or what do you do, Digi digital shovel readiness? I like that, that's very cool. I might use that one. Um, th that's where I think we're going to be. What about you? What do you, what do you think is gonna pan out from this thing? What do you think is gonna be permanent uh, from the result of COVID? Yeah. So I think that um, uh, we're, we're a very resilient, society we are we we uh, uh mother in uh, um what's the old saying um crisis is a mother, mother of invention. invention yeah or need yeah. and so we have decided uh basically how to run our society in a way that's safer we're still exploring we're still evolving so you talk about flu i think the, the flu season i think is going to be dramatically different this year with everybody wearing masks, with everybody socially distancing, with not as many people going out, and that's people packed into trains, I think we have a much less flu uh, right. season this year. Very good, Michael. Because we've never done this before. Yeah. I think I think that's that's one of the things. Hmm. So I don't think we're going to see that. The question becomes: Does this disease come back? You know, the way that people are saying it could come back, or does it do what H one N one did, which basically it went uh, dormant and stayed dormant? You know, right. so we never we never saw a resurgence of that. We expected it was going to be. So we are still learning about COVID nineteen, still, yeah. and what our the way it behaves and interacts within within our community. Right. Um, but I, I do think you're right. A lot there are a lot of changes that are going to continue. I hope that we get to a, a, a position where we understand more about the impacted population. Well, so we already know that if you have, if you're elderly and you have, uh, or you have you know, other diseases, comorbidities, you're susceptible to this disease. So what do we do to really protect that population? Hmm. You know, and let's make sure that when we do those protections, we're not just protecting the wealthy, but we're protecting people, you know, we let, let's try to solve for the issue of somebody who may have a comorbidity, but, but can't stay home, you know, still has to right. go to work. Right. So what do we do there? You know, um, you know, the United States entered into the most generous and most aggressive program to continue to keep our economy moving. Yeah. Well, so maybe as we learn more about, that, we decide that that the aid should go to folks that are in that position. You know, bus drivers, uh, different people who who really can't stay at home and perhaps have heart disease or or have obesity or other issues. So maybe there's a way to kind of supplement what they do, targeted aid that continue their existence comfortably, uh, but at the same time, don't expose them. I don't know, you know, these are, these are just ideas, but they, we have to evolve in terms of how we, yeah. we've written a huge check for everybody. And it has maintained, you know, we haven't had the cliff, you know, so that's awesome, but but it's not sustainable going forward. Right. And the same with our healthcare. You know, what aspects of our healthcare can we do remotely? How do we, uh, you know, change the interface? without changing the quality of the outcomes that we have in our healthcare system. Right. And how do we do this all remotely, digitally, virtually, in such a way that we continue to have the human interface, but we do it safely. And we continue to have productivity, but we do it safely. And we continue to move our economy forward 
to do new innovations and really kind of think through what the post-pandemic world looks like, but do it safely, which is all com- comes back to the cyber. You know, right. we had always thought that, that they go digitally. Well, they, they, again, it's accelerating now. And we, but I don't necessarily know that local government or the private sector has really caught up to what those changes are going to be. And we really need to think in a much more innovative way. Yeah, we're all, I mean, the whole world's building the plane as we fly. And, um, you know, it's not a criticism. And I, and I think we, we society, we're so unappreciative. I mean, there's a lot of criticism for government, which blows my mind. Because if you actually look around the world, look at the Swedes, for example. It turns out they had the dumbest strategy, which might have turned out to be the best strategy. So they did nothing, completely the opposite, right? They just let it, they let it go. But it turns out that right now, this is one study, there's a lot of misinformation because one study and then people start talking about it, that um, herd immunity is 20%, not the 60% we thought it was. So they might have already gotten to herd immunity. Was that the best thing? We, we don't know right now. But what we do know is that the disease does attack primarily senior people and those with underlying conditions, those at risk. And typically, but just as you said, there are some people within that category that are the bus drivers or whoever else that cannot stay home, but are also perhaps... How do, how do I put this politely? A little bit digitally illiterate, right? You know, if you're not, I have a digital job. I'm always involved in Zoom and doing this. So are you, right? You know, so we're used to this. But, you know, uh, when I was in university, I swung a hammer for a living, right? That kind of role didn't put me in front of a computer. So so the the digital illiteracy of that group combined with the pandemic and the cybercrime syndicates that we see around the world gives extra vulnerability. Yeah. I would imagine... A strong education program. I mean, I, I just when I said that, it just sounded lame coming out of my mouth. But uh, there's a gap. There's a need. You know, there's a huge gap, but it's, but it's we have to think through what the gap is. In other words, it's not just for the person who, as you describe, is 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 not digitally aware. I like that better than illiterate. I think digital, digitally aware is kind of a better thing because because they've just never had to. They've never sat behind a desk and never worked with 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 a computer. So. They may have a computer at home, but but they've never really gone to Apple or sat in the stores and learned a lot of stuff because they've got a lot of things going on in their lives. But we have to also take a step back now, and we make assumptions that I don't think are, are valid. So, for example, school kids are going to be partly in school and partly at home. That's what we're going to do in New York, and I think a lot of other states are looking at that. Are we sure that a teacher who was teaching sixth grade last year suddenly knows how to teach online? Right. Are we sure that it comes, that people are going to be able to, to express themselves and have this dialogue back and forth that is absolutely essential to higher education? Right. Um, that they're going to continue this? So anyway, I think there's a lot of training, right. uh, both from the cyber pers- security side to the cyber utilization side. We shouldn't assume that we have the cyber skills necessary, necessary to continue a productive work life virtually. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, we should wrap in about a minute or so, Michael, but um, let's, I always say this to the audience, I would love to continue this dialogue. Now, Michael Balboni, New York on LinkedIn, probably you're the only guy that comes up, right? If you use my actual first name, Edwin Doyle, Manhattan on LinkedIn, I'm the only one that comes up. I would love to continue this conversation with anybody in the audience publicly if you want to over LinkedIn. We can certainly create a forum and a group and a dialogue there to enter into people's news feeds. You can contact us. In fact, Michael, why don't you tell the audience where they can get hold of you, where all your socials are, and then I'll wrap with uh, a couple of uh, words. Sure. Um, I best reached at uh, M Balboni, B A L B O N I, at Redland Strategies. So red is in the color land strategies. Dot com. And um, I'm also on LinkedIn, as uh, Eddie just mentioned. And I must say, you know, I really appreciate a lot of the information that I get through LinkedIn. I like that platform very, very much. So um, yeah, I would too. look forward to a continuation. Me too. Uh, With this, um, thank you. Yes, I will. We'll definitely have you back. Um, this, an archive of this talk will live on cybertalk.org. So that's a blog, cybertalk dot org just as it sounds and actually if you go to cybertalk.org and look at the attachments tab and click on that you'll find supporting material for the conversation that michael and i had today you can also subscribe to the weekly digest or our newsletter so you'll find that at cybertalk uh, we'll also host this on various youtube channels 
To everybody out there, stay safe online. And if anything we can do for you based on this conversation, please reach out to either one of us. Michael, I'm so grateful that you came on this show. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Appreciate fantastic. It. Take care.